Um, so we are going to be talking about the invisible pipes, and that's infrastructure. These are the pieces and the key pieces of technology that actually make all this interoperable and abstraction technology work. Um, as before, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we consider infrastructure, let the panelists introduce themselves and what their project does, and then we'll just dive into it and see where the day takes us. Um, the Again, setting the stage, letting us all get on the same page. Um, I'll let everyone kind of give their own definition of infrastructure because I kind of already did it. Um, so panelists, without further ado, introduce yourself and give us a little description of what your project does. For sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Super excited to be here. My name is uh, Yair Klepper. I'm a co-founder and initial core contributor at Lava, Lava Network. Uh, Lava building an access layer for any chain, helping existing upcoming chains to bootstrap their own infra. We started with RPC, APIs, and going to indexing, uh, oracles, and any type of data in blockchain. Yeah, uh, I'm Jack. Uh, hello again. Uh, so I work for Cos uh, Evmos. So what we do is provide EVM interface into the interchange space. So just make it easier for developers to build applications that are natively crossing in the Cosmos space. Hi guys, uh, Hussein from Union, one of the co-founders uh, engine in the engineering side. Uh, we build a cross-chain uh, uh, blockchain to do seamless uh, cross-chain interaction where we try to abstract uh, the idea of moving any message from one chain to another um, using ZK to make it fast and cheap. I'm Barry from Skip. Uh, we build uh, interoperability infrastructure that powers a couple hundred million dollars of volume across all of the major ecosystems, uh, many of the front ends that you probably use in Cosmos and a number of them outside as well. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, so for people here who might not be like ultra deep in the trenches building applications day to day, can you give them a, a, an overview or an idea of if you're an application developer, and you know, Cosmos is a great example, uh, an application developer who has to consider all of these different multi-chain challenges and problems, what is uh, like, what does the sort of um, landscape look like for a developer who has to build an application that's multi-chain? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Like you have different blockchain with different program languages, different consensus mechanisms. In Cosmos, this is better. This better because everyone uses Tendermint, but it's it's terrible. I mean, I'm sure like Al Gorek, you guys understand because like you doing you know you do automation across these chains. Like again, you don't have the same language, the same tooling that will work across the different blockchain platforms. Yeah, I think like uh, you know, in interoperability um, has to work together with uh, RPC, right? Uh, you know, we started, um, we jumped into Web three. Me and my co-founder uh, after a um, couple of initiatives uh, in Web two, and we realized that the, basically the infrastructure is shit, uh, and it's very very hard to develop different apps, running nodes. How do you get access to the data? And the very core implementation of read write is kind of negligible and, and you know it's kind of forgotten layer today uh, how do you write how do you uh, support this thesis of chain abstraction if you need to run a node in each on every chain how do you support the chain itself when you need to run of the different providers make sure of the quality of service uptime reliability and so forth so i think interoperability cannot go along without the rpc layer yeah, we think about it just in terms of like, if you're building a new app, what is the first interoperability problem you have? And that is getting actual users and liquidity to your chain. Um, and you shouldn't have to worry about where those users are or what chain they're on or what token they might have or whether there's a direct bridge from your chain to that one. And you also shouldn't have to try to understand those things. Uh, Bridges themselves are massively complex. A lot of these solver networks that now people are creating are massively complex. So the way we think about it is just like, how can we build um, an API that makes it so that developers can have a sort of a single API call to get a user from anywhere to their chain in one transaction? And like everything we do kind of works backwards just from that. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's exactly that. So the idea is you, 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 we try to unify like any chain, any liquidity, any users, anywhere, any assets, or any protocol that exists on one chain. You want to access it from another chain. And specifically from um, a protocol developer perspective, it's nowadays extremely difficult if you want to achieve that. So if you want to tap into uh, Uniswap from Cosmos, there is no there is no trivial way of like sending a message, getting the asset back. You have to know the underlying, and um, so so abstracting this, like in internet, basically submitting some a request to a website, Web2 stuff, where you have the router that actually move the packet for you. Uh, when you access Google.com, you you have no idea what's going on under the hood. The only thing you care is having the page uh, shown at the end with the result you expect, and that's. I think what we try to achieve in Web3 right now. Um, so it's really difficult, but all this abstraction will allow the, the end user not to feel any friction when dealing with one chain or another. So how does something like IBC or interacting across chains in IBC compare to interoperability between something like um, Bitcoin Solana or Ethereum Solana, I guess, is a better, probably a better example. I think if I may start, you know, because we are first comers to Web3 in general, but we are super, um, uh, we have strong expertise in tech, cybersecurity, and I think what we fell in love in, in Cosmos and IBC specifically is it was uh, battle tested, uh, I think never got hacked, and um, you know, a lot. Yeah, until today, you know, touch good, that's what they say. Uh, and, um, you know, for us, the most important thing was the execution. Because if you want to go out there and build something, and I know in this space we like to invent ourselves every Monday and Sunday, um, but if you have a piece of technology that can get you faster to where you are, um, this is the why we actually chose uh, to work with IBC. And it proves itself on the one hand, uh, mainnet is coming soon, but on the other hand, you know, the overload of uh, starting two years ago and now only getting to the mainnet, obviously it's coming with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of challenges, let's say. Uh, yeah, that's my pros and cons. Yeah, IBC is just different. It's a different animal, like basically Larry Zero just copy IBC, like client verification, that's like a Cosmos thing. The thing is with IBC is uh, the chain itself is aware of there is a bridge, which is a very different uh, system than all the other non-Cosmos bridging solutions. Because they like for those solutions, you have a third party and you're trusting that third party to do to verify the bridging or asset or message or whatever. What what IBC and Cosmos like is chain native, the chain recognizes it. So like. That's why we don't have hacking issues. That's why the tech is good too. But again, I think that makes a big difference that the chain itself is aware that it is a bridge and is aware of the existence of other uh, blockchains in the space. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, like a lot of interop problems come out of the fact that like Ethereum interop is shit in general. Um, like Ethereum has been massively successful as a cultural project and massively successful at exporting ETH as an asset that other people care about. But because the chain has slow finality and incredibly high gas fees and basically no ability to scale, you end up in this world where like everybody wants ETH, but it's really hard to get out of ETH and you can't do the kinds of routing things that you can on the Cosmos side to like take a token that's on one chain loop it back through the chain where it came from to wherever you're going so that you get like the correct version or the right version, the version that's useful. Um, and then, but because ETH has been so successful as an asset, like everybody else inherits this pain because they all want ETH. Um, they just copy ETH like they don't. Yes, you have to wait 16 minutes for finality or you need to like bootstrap a solver network that you have to trust and they're gonna take a percentage of your volume because they're taking on risk and like, it's just, a shit outcome for everyone, and like IBC has completely avoided this. Tendermint is like the unsung hero of this story because Tendermint is what gives us fast finality. It's not like a property of IBC, it's a property of Tendermint. So, shout out Jaquan. Um, and I think all of the like other 
kind of cross ecosystem interop stories are fraught for somewhat different reasons, but basically usually because um, the asset, like people, people don't care about I can do anything on any chain. People care about like I can hold some asset that I value and like I can use some specific application. And usually um, it's not until something pops off in another ecosystem where people are like, oh, we, we should have interop here and like this is a priority. So like Solana is a great example now where all of a sudden people in Cosmos want to hold Sol or they want to buy Solana shit coins, but you know, a year ago that wasn't the case and so there weren't that many people working on it. I know the composable team kind of was, I know the union guys are and like, I just think over time as people are building blockchains and like more formulaic ways and we get the infrastructure bootstrapped for the existing ecosystems that made some of these shit technical choices early on, like we're gonna get to a point where it's gonna be really good. Um, so I, don't know. I think it's like kind of whack right now, but I'm pretty optimistic. That's uh, that shout out to Jay though. I didn't, I didn't miss that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. IBC is just an example of like an interoperability protocol. It's not like a different thing. It's just a, one of the canonical implementation we have seen uh, emerging in Cosmos. And it's probably successful because it has been built in the chain uh, SDK itself. The difference with all the blockchains right now is that you need to build on top of the base VM, which usually have like shit precompiles. You cannot do the, the math that the counterparty is doing or in a really gas inefficient way. Um, so with ZK, I mean, that's how ETH is becoming a bit less shitty regarding interrupt. Otherwise, like, you, it would have still been a mess. Uh, so I think, I think that's why Tendermint and, and IPC specifically is successful. It's because it has been built in. So whenever you want to deploy chain, you have directly access to this, uh, uh, the information of the other's chain natively. Um, and abstracting over the specifics or the specificities of IPCs to make it like multi-chain capable through like uh, the text like ZK, I think is a good way to uh, show that IPC is not only Cosmos, you know, like it's really a standard, really abstract, you can implement it on, on many other chains. Yeah, Cardano just implemented IBC. Yeah. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> Well, All that's right. cool though, like that's the thing, right? Like the fact that Cardano itself has like the foundation, the chain is aware of the Cosmos space. Look, I know no one's a big fan of Cardano here, but hey, it's, they're still, they're all peers, they build stuff, they do things, ice cream swap, anybody? So, you know. But yeah, I mean, those are all, those are all really good points. Um, it's kind of almost remarkable because it wasn't that long ago that the thought of teams like dedicating time to figure out how to make these multi-chain solutions work was unheard of. People trying to actively, you know, go from Ethereum to Solana or Cosmos to Solana to Avalanche to whatever other chain you want and back. Um, so why do you think this, uh, you know, this trend in interoperability has sort of been has sort of been picking up? Barry, you mentioned that like something takes off in one space and then gets forked to another. But you know, where did where did interoperability start? Where did this kick off? And you know, why is this trending? I will touch just um, you know our perspective uh, um, of of how the ecosystem evolves. So when three years ago when I jumped into uh, Web three. Uh, everyone was telling me like uh, it's going to be a consolidation, right? Like uh, one chain to rule them all. Uh, I think Barry was talking about it before the uh, first mover advantage of ETH uh, and the Ethereum uh, ecosystem, obviously. But today we see you know different uh, um, concepts uh, coming up with hundreds and thousands different chains. Basically, every this every uh, every one of these chains represent different communities, right? And everyone wants at the end of the day they're not using only dollar, they don't use only if, uh, euro. They're using a lot of different uh, currencies that represent the world, right? And if you build this kind of community, you need to make sure that uh, you have the real tools to move assets around them to make sure that you have the tech stack that give you the scalability, availability to bring the billion dApps and users to use this basic layer. On the other hand, um, um, you know, keep developing and improve the tech. Uh, I think Evmos is doing a great job on that with the EVM 
And, um, um, you know, uh, we chose Cosmos because uh, once we were comparing that to subnets at the time and to para, um, uh, para chains, and we see this is, uh, you know, where, um, where all the devs are, where is all the most documented um, um, tech stack there. And I think now the interesting thing that we presented there recently with Lava is the pools, right? Everyone can, every chain can develop and introduce its own incentive pools and invite providers to join the pools. So at the end of the month, they're receiving rewards based on the quality of service. Uh, and we did that successfully with Axelar. We have a great partnership here with Evmos and Near. And uh, yeah, I think um, it really represents the interoperability as the base layer of, you know, how do you consume the data? It's the most excited I've ever been about a lava pool. But really cool. They do a skydive, like if anyone wants to jump out of the plane into a lava pool. Yeah, I just, uh, I just came up with our uh, pool party and uh, everyone who, uh, you know, take a tweet with the merch can, uh, can win a skydive. So, uh, you know, nobody knows you here, guys, in the crowd. So, so if you ever want to jump into a volcano, now's your chance. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, there's like the positive, hopeful story about why interop has become an enormous focus, and then there's the sort of like pessimistic black pill story. Like the, the black pill story is nobody still has really figured out like what are the unique and compelling things that you can do with like blockchains and crypto rails, but they have figured out that nobody else has figured that out too. And so uh, people start to view other protocols as rent seeking and ecosystems as rent seeking. And they're like, well, you know, if a blockchain is going to be a rent seeking thing, like I'm going to be my own blockchain, like I'm not going to let somebody else rent seek from me. And that drives a huge um, movement towards sovereignty. And I think the other thing is just like, we're now, and this is the, like the more optimistic story, like we're now at a point where um, the uh, stack and by building your own chain enables you to experiment much, much faster and do things in very different ways. And like, I think is sort of this evolutionary trend to people doing more stuff to try to figure out, okay, what are the unique kinds of communities and applications we can build with crypto rails? And like, what can we do if we can make those applications accountable to their users in ways that like um, we, we couldn't do with centralized software? So, um, and I think both of those things drive people to say, okay, for our community, we need our own chain. And then like the need for interop just arises from that. Like, and especially when we meet customers, um, it's oftentimes they've decided they're launching a roll-up or a chain or whatever, and they're like, cool, I need to get users here now. It's like after that decision, that's the first thing, and then the interoperability obviously just follows. Yeah, I think, I think it's also more difficult than, than in Web2 because um, uh, servers right now, when they do interop between them, they all trust uh, each other basically, so you don't have to account for any anything. If you get a response from uh, an IP or a domain name, you know, uh, you do an RPC, you get a result. That's fine. Like you don't have to to, to do any math to verify the result or whatever. Uh, in Web3, it's really difficult because you have to account for the difference in consensus of the, each chain. Uh, and the user don't want to, to deal with that at all, like the, 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 the finality level of the counterparty, like who cares, it takes 12 minutes to, f to be finalized, I want my asset to move or like my message to go through. So um, dealing with that, like abstracting that again from, from the user such that uh, uh, we offshore the risk of finality, for instance, to the networks of, of solvers uh, being built right now, uh, would probably uh, uh, help a lot in the journey. And how important is collaboration amongst all the different teams working on these solutions to actually like drive them forward and make them successful as implementations? You can start. Yeah, so I can give an example. I think, um, so at Union, for instance, we don't try to, to do everything. Um, as I just mentioned, abstracting the, the offshoring the, the risk to third party um, market makers or however you want to call them is uh, something we don't want to run ourselves. So it's basically building a seamless API where 
Uh, we provide full finality guarantee, like an ISP or something you can imagine. Uh, you know the, the data will arrive at some point, get an acknowledgement. You know the data has been verified against the counterparty. So you cannot be wrecked, like you cannot be uh, censored or anything. Uh, and, and then we provide like APIs for third party to actually, like the experts of like doing market making, for instance, will be able to hook into and, and do their best uh, to have that. So like trying to um, uh, uh, collaborate with other team, of course, but uh, uh, keep doing what you do, at the, the best thing you can do, like not trying to solve everything. We could probably do a whole panel on collaboration just between Agoric and Skip. These guys are great. <laughs> yeah, 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 I appreciate you guys saying that. Um, I think it's called orchestration layer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, that's later. We, we think about this, um, again, I have like, the, the positive story is I think that we're moving towards a world where it is much more common for uh, different teams to, to collaborate. The thing that I worry a lot about in interoperability though, especially with this move to chain abstraction, is like the way we are getting to train abstraction is going to be with like this new like layer of many different kind of like protocolized middlemen that now sit between things and everybody sort of wants to be monopoly and everybody like is going to become a toll booth over time and everybody's gonna like try to get their slice. You've got like the solver network and they're gonna want their slice and you've got the bridge aggregator and they're gonna want their slice and you've got the bridge and you know, it's like, and like how complicated is all this shit gonna get? Um, and at that point, how much money is gonna be left at the end of the day for the user? And then people are like, oh, well like, no, it moves towards the thing where people pay the most. But interop, because all of these standards are, are not standard uh, by any means and, and because there's such enormous network effects, like it tends towards this kind of monopolization. Um, and I think we have to work really hard and teams have to do a lot to try to counteract that. So like one thing that we're doing is we've built this extremely complex system that aggregates dozens of different DEXs, 10 different bridges at this point, like, um, and creates sort of compound routes out of them so you can do things that no one individual bridge can do. That is like a very powerful system. In some ways it's like kind of a scary system because you've got like a protocol on one side and they're like, we have no idea where our users come from. And then like you have us and we're like, don't worry about it. And then on the other side there's all this complexity. We're just like open sourcing that whole thing. Um, and we're gonna be inviting people to contribute to it, to add new kind of mechanisms for it. And like the reason is that we wanna try to make it accountable to integrators because we think that that's the more valuable thing for us to do over time but because we also think that that's like the behavior that we need to model for the interop space. So, yeah. You know, I think um, the key, the key important thing here is uh, keep it simple, right? Because if we're gonna overcomplicate, um, uh, you know, it's uh, there's no end to that. We see so many new protocols are coming up, and I think uh, chain abstraction is, uh, is it will play a key role in the next years for. Um, determining how, what protocol gonna, gonna build, how it's gonna make us much more easier for devs to build on each and every chain and to kind of fulfill their vision, right? At the end of the day, we like to uh, make this analogy as if uh, you're surfing the web today, right? You have no idea when you're typing www what is the version of the HTTP you're using, right? Uh, what is TCP IP? Where the website is located is the GCP, AWS, and this kind of abstraction is something that uh, um, you know is crucial to uh, make the next bull run much more uh, easy and much more adaptable, adaptable in terms of the different uh, DApps using that. And yeah, and uh, obviously I will relate to the basic layer of read-write data. Yeah, I'm not from the Cosmos space, but you guys suck at coordinating. It's a, it's a sovereignty thesis, you guys do your own, own ones, but honestly, like, you guys got to work together a little bit more. Like, none of the chains know what they're doing, like, none of the chains are like, I don't know, like, the, like, the EDM Foundation is very successful at pushing for, like, improvement, improvements. And something about Cosmo, again, I think there's a lot of great technical innovations, but it's not being pushed in a certain direction. And this is not like, right now, like, with the AADAO, you know, the, like grant venture initiative is happening a little bit more, but yeah, like I don't know, Cosmos got to coordinate a little bit better. 
we got the uh, signal for, we got one minute left. So in uh, closing remarks, um, think about what is some version or some aspect of the sort of best case scenario for interoperability? What does it look like one year from now if things go according to your wildest dreams? Uh, one year from now? Like, probably not that much is that different. It's not enough right, so I, I don't know, 10, 10 seemed too long, like 10 years seemed well, too long, five years didn't seem yeah, long enough. Like, I do think um, the, the thing that we're going to get to in like one or two years is between major ecosystems or major chains where you do have a lot of kind of shared action and shared users, you're going to have these kinds of very seamless, so I can do something with my money on one chain and, and, and it's going to work on the other. We already have that in Cosmos, it's like this works, you can buy an NFT on Stargaze from Noble like in one transaction and that's sick, I think you're going to start seeing that up elsewhere, like other places are going to catch up to Cosmos in that respect. I think things between ecosystems are still going to feel pretty horrible. Yeah, for, uh, in my perspective, I want to see more and more uh, dApps building and more uh, actually uh, usage uh, that, that we have. Uh, obviously, uh, in the last half a year, we start supporting more and more chains with Lava, and in a few weeks, we're going to have the mainnet, so I'm super excited to see in one year uh, how we support hundreds of chain because basically everyone can spin up his own chain, spec, support that, and solve the RPC neglected layer. Yeah, so one year from now, yeah, I, I hope we will be able to basically uh, use Keep to go through Union, have unified Cosmos with any ETH, L2 or L1, hopefully, uh, fully finalized, uh, just less decentralized, no just a third party, no way to censor you, and uh, yeah. Uh, like Barry said, I don't think a year is gonna change all that much, but if we talk about like five years, hopefully, we have like games that you could just play, you have like Cosmos gaming blockchains that you could then use that NFT, collateralize it, take out USDC loans, pay your mortgage. That's the future, you know, like, so yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, hold each one of these people uh, accountable verbatim to what they said is going to happen in the next year. And uh, thank you guys so much for shedding some light on the interoperability infrastructure. And now think of your devs next time you're swapping some tokens. These people put a lot of work into making all that stuff barely work. So thank you so much. And I'll hand it back off to David.